it, okay, so now you go through that, you end up, you you get your accepted to your residency at John John Hopkins. You show up there. What what's that like? <laughs> well, I remember when I I interviewed at Hopkins for medical school as well. Um, and I, I was lucky enough to get in there for medical school. And at the time, I think Hopkins was technically the best medical school in the country. I think it was Harvard and Hopkins were the best two, and Stanford was, you know, maybe third, fourth, fifth. But I remember when I interviewed there for medical school, at the end of the interview, like I had to spend a night there. And so they put us up in the dorms for the med students, which great idea. You get to meet your upper classmates. And I remember I said uh, that Friday night, I said, hey, I'm going to go walk down to the harbor. It's like a mile and a half down the road. And they were like, oh, no, no, you can't do that. Hmm. I said, what do you mean? They said, you, 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 you can't walk outside of the hospital. And then they pointed out that on every corner, there was like a booth with an armed guard. There's a guard in full armor with uh, an automatic weapon. And so... I remember at the time thinking, yeah, I probably don't want to go here for med school. So, And, of course, Stanford sort of, for a guy who'd never been to California and who'd lived in miserable cold weather his whole life, I was like, it could have been the 100th ranked medical school. I was still going there. <laughs> yeah, so, I have some actual stats that I pulled up. So, war zone. In 1993, there was 48 murders for every 100,000 people. There's, what, 700,000 in the, in the city. The next highest was in 2015. 55 and in 1993 again there was 353 homicides homicides yeah almost one a day and so you know i have to put this in there just you know because we're sitting here calling it a war zone so when i was in ramadi in 2006 the 11 ad which is the the ready first brigade you know 5600 soldiers while we were there with them for six months they lost 61 guys so what I'm saying is now that doesn't count the enemy casualties, yeah. but it counts the friendly casualties that are showing up at our med center, right? So there, you know, you're talking three or four hundred. Well, you just said one a day. Yeah, about one, one a day. day. Okay. So, um, so you knew how bad it was when you got I mean, well, because you'd already I mean, visited I, it. Yeah, I sort of knew it was dangerous, but but I think when I decided that. You know, for this that season of my life, you got to sacrifice everything, and you have to go to the place where you're going to get the best training. And I didn't want to leave California because you know, four years in California for the first time was, you know, I mean, you know, you guys know what it's like. Yeah. I mean, it was like I don't ever want to leave this place. But I also knew I just couldn't get that level of training on the West Coast, and it was, you know, you basically had to go to a place like Hopkins, Brigham and Women's in Boston, maybe Wash U in St. Louis was going to offer a very similar environment. Um, so then, you know, so then I ended up ranking it first. They ranked me first. So away we go. We get lucky. It's a match made in heaven. And that's like kind of February of your senior year. And then reality sits in, which is you've got sort of four months until you have to show up. And that was kind of like the, oh shit moment, right? Like that I really just signed up for this. Um, and a good friend of mine who was two years ahead of me in medical school, his name is Brian Dunham. He's now a uh, pediatric head and neck, uh, ear, nose, and throat surgeon at CHOP in Philadelphia. He was at Hopkins, which was at the time the best ear, nose, and throat program in the country. And he actually recommended I read this book, The Corner. Because, and Brian's one of these guys who's just, you know, he's just, he's like a Renaissance man, you know, like not only is he a great surgeon, he's like a gifted artist. You know, his side job is medical illustration. Like, you can't <laughs> believe what this guy can do. But he's introspective, right? And he was he said, Look, you know, you're you're gonna sign up to be in this war zone and you're going to be taking care of people that it's going to be very easy to despise. So he said, You need to read this book to gain a sense of their perspective. Um, because very like I said, you know, so so at the time I, I can't remember the stats. I feel like at the time that I was there, we averaged about sixteen penetrating traumas a day. Now, to put that in perspective, in general surgery, you're on call every second to every fourth night. So average about every third. That means every third night, 120 times a year, you will spend the night in the hospital, not sleeping, waiting to take care of any trauma patient. So if every third day and night, you know, 16 of these people are getting shot and stabbed, you're going to have a lot of time in the ER, in the trauma bay, dealing with that. And it's really easy to get jaded really quickly. 
It's fun for the first month, and then all of a sudden, every time somebody gets shot, it's preventing you from sleeping. Which, when we're sitting here all well rested, sounds like a very callous thing to say, but all of a sudden, you're sort of like, damn it, man, Like I can't eat because the trauma pager just went off again. To this day, I still eat shockingly fast, and it drives my wife nuts, but she doesn't understand. I said, I, I think it's just I'm a victim of you never know when you're going to have to stop what you're doing, and that might be your last meal. Even I shave quickly, because the worst thing that could happen is you got shaving cream all over, and the trauma pager goes off, and you got to run down half shaved. You, know, you got one side of your beard down, and the other side not. So it's stupid things like that. So, <clears throat> so that was Brian's recommendation. So I got the book immediately, devoured it, found it to be the most depressing thing I had ever it is. read. It's heavy. Um, made more depressing by the fact that they pull no punches, no names are changed. So every person you read about, you were reading about it in a completely uncensored, uncensored, unfiltered way. And I mean, you, you read it, you know, there's nothing happy about this book. Like you just finish it and you think, yes, you have more empathy and you understand where, where these folks are going to be coming from. But it's like, I don't, there's, it's not like you finish that book and go, ah, here's the solution. We need a six-point plan that's going to do X, Y. It's yeah. like, I don't know. That's kind of why I read that one excerpt. It's like, we can't win, mm. which is an awful thought. And that's what that's the impression the book gives you, is, is we can't win. And I, I, that the, the way he phrases it of being like, it doesn't matter how many police and whatever you do, you're, you're going against human desire. Well, the, the stat that you reiterated, and I remember it very well from when I read this book the first time was, you couldn't take every junkie and put them away. If you took every federal and state prison bed in Maryland, you'd have three people for it if you just you looked at the users. Never mind the guns, the money, and everything that comes with it. So, yeah, that's not a solution. 